it, this was called Living Tradition when we put it together, but it's, it's uh, the title that essentially, um, when I was thinking about coming down here, I was thinking that we would probably have a number of people presenting some sort of position paper, and so I thought I would uh, have one ready in case, you know, to fit into the pattern. And uh, instead, it seems like there weren't too many of those sorts of things brought. This one has been something that's fascinated me and my son Richard as well over the last four or five years. And it's a way of extending those city's patterns that have been developed in Italy over the last 50 years. Uh, there is an English language translation of the uh, writings of Gianfranco Canigia or his teachings, but he's, uh, he's very poorly translated. And generally, it seems like they, the uh, Italians like to use sentences very awkwardly. You can already see in this particular quote, there's some awkward uh, translation that makes it a little hard to follow. So it's taken me a long time to digest and come up with ways of understanding this. And one way that both Richard and I have come to an understanding a little bit more for you, first of all, Richard was able to go into an internship in Genoa with one of the grandsons of Moratori. And while he was there, they did a uh, project for Detroit, which uh, was really quite amazing, but I don't think it registered with the competition judges because it was so completely alien to anything they'd ever seen before. So we'll see a couple of brief uh, images of that. But this is a different way, an alternate way, and not necessarily, uh, it's like, like the difference between uh, different forms of education. You know, you've got many different theories, uh, Piaget, Montessori, this is a theory of how the city grows that can seem very effective and very real and seem to approach the truth in some ways. It's very much a bottom-up way of looking at things, and I found that it dovetails very well with Bill Westfall's top-down uh, classicism. So this is like two different things, and they kind of dovetail in the middle very nicely. Uh, in order to get all this in, I'm going to read a few things as I go along so to make sure I don't miss anything. But I'll try to make it as loud as I can. Changes the levels of development or the size of the buildings, 
uh, or the types of tissue. You can have different kinds of tissue. And this can apply, well, we'll see, it can apply at any time, at any place. It's not just look, look only in medieval or Bronze Age Italian towns. Well, the work of the Italian school focuses on ancient continental cities that originated in the Bronze Age, the theories can apply also to colonial settings like American towns. Whether the, sorry, this thing is, it's different. What's, what's causing it to be different up there than what it is here, Richard? Probably showing you probably showing in the next slide. slide. Is that what it is? Yeah. <clears throat> so you're prepared. Yes, there we go. <laughs> yes. So I'm prepared, but I am not. don't know what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> while the work of the Italian school focuses on those ancient continental cities that originated in the Bronze Age, the theories can also apply to colonial settings like American towns. Whether the initial structure is based on an unplanned settlement or a route or on a planned grid like we see here in, in Charleston, the way towns grow and change remains the same. The grid provides a structuring matrix within which the principles uncovered by Moratori and Canigia continue to operate. And here we see the scales of the city. These uh, routes and patterns can be mapped onto a hierarchy of scales ranging from that of the territory, to the city, to the neighborhood, and each within its own, with each of these neighborhoods have their own special buildings, which are buildings that don't conform to the tissue. Uh, the most important of these scales is the urban scale by which the city is organized. Below this is the architectural scale under which are grouped the rules for organizing building tissue. The building scale catalogs the parts and materials of individual buildings. Here you see a uh, what he calls a synoptic table. And what I've done here is looked at Richmond, which is my native city, and at Petersburg, which is nearby, and tried to see how moratory could be used to apply to those. Yes? Can I just say that one way to put this, and I've, ran, I've run into it with other people, is that you have the matrix group, mm -hmm. and then you have side streets coming off of it, so it's kind of like a double-sided roll, and then you cut streets across. I mean, this is just notional. But it, it's, it's how the, the deep structure works. Right. It's basically you grow out from the center. So in the CNU, we've had a couple of debates about whether grids are good or bad. And the guy, Paul Knight, who's so in favor of grids, uh, doesn't really, I mean, he, uh, he understands it, but he doesn't really grasp, or didn't really grasp, the growth path, how you get a grid by applying that rule, right? And also so how a predetermined grid can then be used by this growth pattern as, a, as to infill, almost like a beehive fills with the patterns of the, of the bees' dwellings. So that right, so you start, you, see, if you, you have this notional grid. You say everything's going to be gridded, and you lay it out in a Jeffersonian grid. And then you start to occupy it. And the first ones that are going to be, the first lots that are going to be occupied are on the main route. And then people sort of feather off into the sides and the backs. So, um, and there's a preference for facing in that direction. So people usually at the corner face the main route, then the and, side and, route. And we'll be getting into a little bit of that, but yeah. that's really helpful because it's really hard to explain. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try it. And when I, you can chime in when we get to that. Uh, basically, though, they have that urban scale, and then you have this building scale where the buildings follow these typologies. And in Petersburg, this is the typology in this particular neighborhood for which we did a pattern book. Uh, there aren't any bungalows. There aren't any uh, book buildings that don't conform to this typology in the neighborhood. So it's a very easy one to write a pattern book for. Uh, this, this, uh, during periods of civil continuity, when the, when the city is operating uh, without any kind of wars or interruptions, you get uh, vernacular building traditions are, are operative, and serial building tissue expands onto these secondary routes that parallel the main route, uh, according to uh, a typological process, where, whereby the maker is guided by a mental plan that corresponds to this invisible grammar of, of, of building that's passed down among the owners and the builders over time. Moratori and his colleagues refer to this operative process of vernacular or folk design as spontaneous building. And the use of a mental plan shared by, within a community over time without the need for choices as spontaneous consciousness. Not unlike the vernacular mind, but this is an operative one, not, a, not a, one that's employed critically by a professional. This, uh, at any rate, they, they use this mental plan within the community 
and they really don't have a need for choices as we think of making a decision about a design. Will it, will it be this, will it be that? They are guided without thinking twice by the spontaneous consciousness to satisfy particular needs. And it results in beautiful Italian hill towns, or Rome, or Genoa, or Richmond, or Charleston. Once you start doing this reading, you're now in exercising what Muratori calls the critical consciousness. Critical consciousness is the position adopted by persons in times of crisis, when inherited ways of acting are no longer accessible. And that's where we are today. Persons utilizing critical consciousness no longer possess spontaneous consciousness to the degree that they have become aware of it. We resort to critical consciousness to resolve specific needs. Uh, we are never actually fully in the world of critical consciousness. We have spontaneous elements to our thinking. We have automatic responses. We have to look like a problem. We can solve it. We know what a house should look like. But we remain linked to the unexamined vestiges of this spontaneous consciousness that uh, help to direct our decisions. Reading the city is the first step in organizing a project, an architectural project, by according to Moratorium. By reading the city's tissue, it's possible to recreate its development and reconstruct the formerly invisible rules by which basic and specialized tissue is, has been extended in the past. Then, the planner or architect makes use of critical consciousness to place new buildings and features into the existing city in a way that reinforces rather than undermines the city's existing patterns. Each matrix route, this is Richmond, uh, showing different uh, periods in which it was enlarged. And the main route, the matrix route, is here. This is a, an Indian trail that goes from the mountains to Jamestown. And it originally was much wobblier as it followed the ge geography a little bit more. And this is a side road that's probably brought to bring in tobacco uh, in the 1740s. Uh, each matrix route is lined with two pertinent strips, a series of built lots along a route that relate to it. In Richmond, the form of the pertinent strip was conditioned by surveying practices learned by colonial officials and surveyors during the 17th century. It was also affected by the lack of previous European settlement on the land, although the influence of Indian uses on the placement of routes and river crossings, etc., should not be underestimated. The form of towns was often the result of the simple production of the requisite number of half-acre lots on a given tract of land, sometimes without regard to topography. In Richmond's case, the lots just go across the cliffs and the hills. Four of the lots were often combined into a square block. As one of the scholars of this surveying tradition has observed, similar gridiron plans are typical of towns founded by the English along the eastern seaboard, and more generally, by Europeans wherever foreign territory has been colonized since the expansion of the Greek civil. Can, can you clarify half acre? Half acre would be, uh, I'll have another map in a moment and I'll show you. This one, this is a Civil War era map, and the half acre has been obscured by later development, by later tissue growth. But it's, they're two acre blocks. Yeah, this block is two acres, and the actual the dividing line is right four, here four. and right here. And you can see one of the vestiges of one of those dividing lines right here. Yeah. And then the alleys are, are just are placed opportunistically. There are no alleys provided and you have to kind of create them. So all through Richmond, you get, the alleys don't line up until you get to First Street, and then from then on, all the alleys line up perfectly, and you can see you know, down through them. So it's, they, that's when they began in the 1840s to put alleys into the plan, design them in. The, net, the uninflection nature of these blocks in the gridded towns of the colonial period meant, made it possible for the lot holder to orient the building toward whichever of the two streets that formed the outer border of his lot. So you could go, East, or you could go south, or whatever. This choice was directly related to which of the two streets was more significant as a route. Since most of the first lot owners in a town were merchants, lot orientation was entirely based on the volume of traffic reaching each business. And that's still the case today. And when you put in a bypass, you kill all the business because that's dependent on that traffic of being able to get to the business. Since uh, each two acre block could be acquired by a single developer owner, who would have room then for gardens and outbuildings and land to subdivide later for his children and his inheritances as the town grew. So it's almost like they understood from the start this thing's going to become a European, tightly, uh, tightly developed town. But for the meantime, we can put in a garden and have a smokehouse and some chickens and a, and a horse. Um, so many of these lots were developed by one, one block was, was allocated to each buyer. And the prices were pretty cheap. The size of the block again? 
Two acres. Two acres. Uh -huh. And this was pretty much universal across Virginia. There are variations, and also Maryland. It's, if you look at um, reps, it's all in there. Although he never talks of it lots. It's the weirdest thing. He does, but you can see them in there. But he doesn't even consider plot, a lots at all as part of his urban theory. Just curious, do you know the width of the street? Oh, the street width is yeah. 55 feet. And the blocks are laid out according to the length of the number of poles, it's 16 and a half poles by uh, eight poles, I think. And that gives them a slightly rectangular shape. They're not actually square, but it's just a surveying technology. Is, is it rods? And they're called poles. poles? They call them poles. But uh, they're rods? I think rods are shorter than poles. We'll have to find them. I think rod, rods are those things that are like formed into chains, and then the poles are pieces of wood. That made it that equal several rods. So sometimes <laughs> poles were 22 feet. Yeah, poles would be about, sometimes it's 22, sometimes it's 16, I'm not sure. I'm, rods I'm not, are 16. Honest. I'm not an authority on, on that. So maybe it's, it's whatever it was in that area. Whatever it was in that area, right. <coughs> Lots were sort of like the foot in different cities in Europe. Lots were uh, rapidly subdivided along the most intensely used routes. And development in new towns was limited to the size of this main street or of a river landing. Uh, linking the town to the sources of trade or production. So you're not going to find any buildings in the early years that aren't on the roof. Um, you said the houses could fit to go to wherever the, the bottom right. was. But did, it, did they tend to fit towards where it says, it's like Main Street there? Yeah, this is Main Street. Because, and this is yeah, the, this is the that, It's interesting that they were divided so that you didn't, the most, the bulk of your property, since you're more rectangular, actually which is slight, the side versus to It's the only like eight feet yeah. more, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a little still, like, it's, it's a little more democratic than hanging up a main street. Right, and I'm not sure wh who selected that directionality. Uh, but at any rate, this during this initial period of development, the majority of the grid may have been completely invisible. All you would see if you came to Richmond was the main street. You wouldn't even know that the rest of the stuff was there. And that would go on for decades. As the town expanded its range of functions and services and civic activities, these streets, these parallel, whatever he calls, uh, built uh, planned building uh, routes are laid out deliberately to receive the buildings that expand from the main street as that, the land values go up. Uh, the grid was so placed as to be closely aligned with existing routes as possible, especially when, as at Richmond, there was an extant, less formal settlement already on the ground. Where geography intervened, the grid was circumvented or suppressed. In this way, the grid of planned streets and blocks can be seen as a matrix which conditions the form of the aggregations of buildings and of roofs, but does not block the orientation or the position of the roofs and aggregates themselves. So things can move around within this grid almost like an unplanned Bronze Age town because you're free to move around, at least in these initial stages. Things get more dense. You can't move out of the town, which is, originates in 1738. And you can see that the civic buildings, we'll talk in a minute about the courthouse located here and so forth. And there you can see the lots really clearly. The city extended along this matrix route, which took the form of an armature that reached from the eastern end of Main Street here to the, and then climbed the steep slope of Shaco Hill. The capital is right here, and, and then along what's now Broad Street. And you can see all the streets are the same size. There's, there's, it's completely uh, unart unarticulated in that respect. Uh, all the taverns, hotels, shops, and many houses were first located along, directly along this matrix route, and all civic buildings were placed in relation to it, whether facing towards it or deliberately placed away from it. Because here we have the, uh, this is not even on here, it's in the previous map, let's look at that real quickly. The church is located up on the very remote corner on top of the hill. It's in a, in a not in a, a really seriously traveled area. Nodes are the significant points where routes intersect and where they meet significant geographic features. On a matrix route, building tissue forms at a pole or at a node between poles. The settlement established by William Byrd II at Richmond called Shaco's, sometimes before 1730, was just such a place, a proto-urban nucleus, a village with commercial industrial functions only. And the irregularity of these lots that you see here represent that early town. You can read it. Even though there's no history related to this, we have no ownership, no records of any sort, you can read the history of the city. And I've actually just projected back Weimar's settlement onto these lots because it's, it's the way that Mortuary reads the city. You, you, can, you can interpret a Romanian village, you can interpret an Italian hill town. You can see by the pattern of the lots that endure 
what the deep history of the place is. This was followed later by a regularizing of the matrix root within this grid beginning in 1737. Each neighborhood, or to use another name for what Kanija calls a nuclei within the town or city, has its own axis, center, and boundary, and over time, the building tissue responds to these forces in a variety of ways. Um, I'm going to skip over a few here and just sort of move us along. Each urban nucleus has a center and a periphery. In the same way, each town is made up of secondary nuclei that exhibit their own centers, outskirts, and boundaries. So you here, you have this center uh, node, and then you have different nodes that interrelate with each other. These are antinodal points, and these are nodal points. And so sometimes you put an important building like the state, the capital is on an antinodal point. Or, or you might put the market at the nodal point, depending on its relationship to the roots or its function. These nuclei exhibit both linear nodality and punctiform nodality. This is just part of the fun of trying to figure out what Mortuary is talking about, so I just sort of throw this out there. But here's the pump. This is linear nodality. So this building has a nodality which is linear and can spread out across the city and affect what's happening on the next streets, out as far as four streets out. That the significance of that road will affect it. And then punctiform nodality is where there's a, a, a corner where everything happens. Special buildings have an organic form that makes them difficult to place in the body of basic buildings. And here we mean by organic, it's like an organ. It's like your stomach or your kidney. It's not like anything else that you have. So it's called, he calls it organic. <laughs> it's very different from what we think of as organic. Uh, these often have a large single room, such as a church, a theater, or a hall. Uh, Government-related buildings, like the church, the courthouse, or the market house, or the capital, will tend to be found on the axis with these intersection of nodal axes. So here's the courthouse. It's built, it's moved from the public square into the middle of the street because it's the government and they can do that. And it gives the building an urban scale significance that you'll see time and time again here in Charleston. You can see the Unitarian churches lined up at the end of the street. You know, there's lots of examples of that. And then uh, the market is on the edge of town. The Masonic Lodge, not being a government-related institution, is not on an axis. And the church is located up here on this very remote corner where the country folk can get to it easily. Uh, it seems all that the market is located on the... We, you'll look at French and medieval and European examples of markets. Often they are on the margin where they start because they're smelly and noisy. And then the city grows and they become centrally placed. And that's what's happened here. In, in fact, as soon as the ad <coughs> city becomes the state capital of 1580, they add another enormous section and this becomes the heart of the city where it still is today, although it doesn't really behave like that. It starts off on the edge of the creek. Other uh, private or service-related buildings, special buildings, are inserted into this building tissue, like libraries, schools, markets. Uh, they can either serve the whole city, or they can serve individual neighborhoods, and their function can change over time. And they often are connected architecturally so that the branch library will be a diluted version of the main public library, so that there's a hierarchical relationship between the center and the, and the sub-mode the modules. This where it fits perfectly with Westfall. They, they, they sort of intersect right about there, this idea of dilution of the classical orders. The diversification of special building can be seen in the sequence of market house up here, assembly hall and market house here, uh, the sheriff's office spins off from the market house, the police station spins off from the market house, the jail, the firehouses, and the city courthouse were all originally housed in that one building. So you get, you get a diversification of building types uh, across the city, and a, a similar hierarchy grows up. The position of each element in the city and neighborhood, whether on a route, uh, uh, whether it's a route or a building or a square, in relation to nodal or antipodal, antipodal points or axes, determines its identity, role, and level of continuity of its neighbors. So, uh, in this situation, there's a hierarchy of roots within a neighborhood, which is what Bruce was talking about, uh, where the first route flanking a commercial street will sometimes be the least likely to have shops along it. So if this is the main route, or let's say this is the main route, you'll have the shops here, and they intensify towards the node. They're more valuable lot, lots, more significant businesses. And then the next street over has very, very little on it because it's where the sort of service happens. And it's too close to the main one to be just right. And then you go over one more, and you begin to see 
a different kind of development. Uh, the second plant is more likely to fill up the stores before the first one. And if you look and start looking at cities, you see this pattern that parking lots are on the second street over, and then the next street has stores. It's, it really doesn't work that way. Then you get layering over time. So here we see an example of where Second Street is across thoroughfare. From an early date, meant that the lots on the east-west corners, east-west streets were aligned, so that even some corner buildings face Second Street. So you see here is uh, this is the main drag, and here of course it dominates. The buildings all face it. When you get up here to this corner, you start seeing buildings facing Second Street. The fact that this is an, an African American commercial center of the city means that you have a duplication of all the, the institutions that serve the rest of the city are duplicated here. And so you have a, it's a very important street, not only from the early days as a route into the city, but it's also becomes, because of that, becomes a commercial district for the African American community. Similarly, Charles Hancock, uh, who's traced the changes along the 600, 800 blocks of Gray Street from 1884 to 1924. And you can just see here very briefly that in the, the original period, you've got, this is uh, broad, which is lined with the most uh, fashionable shops, small. And then you've got residences along Gray Street, next, next one block away, kind of not very important functions. And then a few years later, 1905, here's Broad Street. The, build, the, the shops, some of them are turning into bigger businesses. And here, you get a replacement with a more dense form of development, including some churches. And then finally, by 1924, Everything, including, and there are also small shops, I should say, along here that have begun to grow. Then everything by 1924 is replaced with churches and hotels. And then the next street over becomes a commercial street. So you just get all kinds of interesting patterns that you can trace through the use of this way of looking at the city. And it is layered over time as well. Also, you can um, count the number of doorways. And if you, if you have a good snapshot of this, I don't think it's Sandboard, it's the other one. This is the same. We don't have. We only have Sandra and Rich. Hopkins often did the doorways, and you can count. You know, like on the top, there might be forty doorways per street. Like there might be, there might be one for every store, and one to go upstairs from the front. And then on the other side, there might be like eight, one for each front door, and then one for each back door. Maybe. I didn't even realize that this is about great grandfather's uh, merchant tailor business. I didn't even realize I had accidentally caught it on the snapshot. I just realized it. Uh, but he got wiped out very quickly, uh, you know, and became a, a big saloon in there, I think. Honestly. You can actually score it. So yep. you, yeah. can up, you can add them up and you can see how important this street is. And, and each, each corner can get a, each corner can get a, like a diagram to show how important it is as a node. You can have a hierarchy of nodes. Uh, then we see here infill building. This is the rule that Bruce is also alluding to. Uh, according to Gianfranco Canizia, occurs where cereal tissue, such as row hoses, fills the both sides of the matrix roof. At this point, the backyard of the buildings occupying the corner lots increases in value and is changed into a buildable, albeit undersized lot, from its previous role. And this is so clear when you go to Romania, to a small village that's essentially medieval in its structure, or in Italy, the same pattern happens. Now, in places like Chicago, apparently, I, I haven't studied it closely, but this was actually built into the street plan. The lots on the side streets were even part of the original plan in some parts of the city. And even in Richmond, in the fan district, you'll see there's a provision for lots facing the side. But here, this was this is just the pattern that underlies it. It can happen, obviously, in, a, in older cities. This is all the streets curve, and the block, there are no regular blocks. And the arrows in the diagram set, show, you see the one on C. That shows the extent of blocks that are all facing the, the street. This is the main route. Right. And then when the you go to two, you start back at the depth of the building. And three, on the back street, it's front, side, and back. And the back street is just that, those few lots. And what that's called, they call it clogging. Clogging. Is it wonderful? Yeah, that's exactly the term. So uh, clogging is not a bad thing. It's just how it works. And then when it gets to a certain level of clogging, then you create another street, or you cut another street through to create more easy, more easy circulation. Because all of a sudden, that big area in the middle starts looking really juicy. You think that's some money out of that. So that's, I've sort of gone over the basic rules. There's, 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 a, there's a, a book, unfortunately, the current English language book on it, which is interpreting basic building, is out of print, I'm afraid to say. So I've got a copy of it. It's, it, it was printed about, I think, 2002. There's an effort to make this theory more accessible to English-speaking audiences, but 
if they don't have books that you can buy, it's kind of hard to, to get access to it. It's also a crack translation. Terrible, terrible. And it, I think the original book is pretty awful. So it's not like it's... <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is a great... It's essentially translations. It's people writing down uh, Kanichia's class notes. And the diagrams are all sort of like taken with a pre-cell phone camera from these little drawings that he might have Xeroxed, you know, or something. So it's very hard to figure out what he's talking about. Uh, but basically here you can see in this wonderful Civil War uh, photograph the whole range of things going on. You've got here is a kind of what we call a mature enrichment. I call it a mature basic building. This is a store with a piano nobile parlor and bedrooms where a merchant, a wealthy merchant with King of Prussia mantelpieces and uh, elegant furniture would live. This, this is his house and this is his store. And it's essentially everybody lived in Richmond because everybody was a merchant, unless you were something professional. <laughs> Or a clerk, you lived at this piano nobile level, and you had a balcony, and you could watch, just like in Florence or various places, what's going on in the street. That building is a mature building, and then you have here, possibly an earlier 18th century or late early 19th century frame store building, and then you see they're being replaced with these large department stores in the 1850s, and warehouses and other sorts of buildings. Uh, uh, wholesale merchants. So what we were able to do, and I'll just briefly show you this, is uh, actually, if we can possibly integrate this kind of thinking into modern development, it can be through a synoptic pattern book, where uh, we were actually commissioned to do this one for a neighborhood in Petersburg, and uh, you can actually help builders do their critical thinking and think, get to the point, it may be a substitute for critical thinking, but you can get, help them get to the point where they can think about ways of adding buildings that contribute to this historic pattern. doesn't mean that you can't build a bungalow, but if, if the, the neighborhood could be enriched if people were just thinking about the patterns and trying to, or professionals or planners. This, uh, we actually wrote it at the different scales of intervention. Here you see uh, certain, so this is what we call the Petersburg house. It's a double house. It either comes in a single cell, uh, doubled back and front or it comes with the side passage, so you have two people living right across the plot line. So they actually, they're actually divided up into lots. Then we have the three different scales that we mentioned before, the urban scale, the architectural scale, the building scale. Uh, and these are the rules, that, the sort of initial rules, where if it affects, if your periphery work is a curb cut or new street lights, then you need to start with urban, urban patterns. If your building affects the architectural scale, like it's a new building or an addition or a garage, you begin with architectural patterns then it is a building scale, like siding, chimney, roof, dormer. Then you begin with building patterns, and then, or you, you know, then you keep on going down the list. Uh, and we there's some rules that Muratori identifies for the way that basic buildings are, or the way that tissue develops. And we have basic buildings, which are those buildings that line the main streets that, that have the residential and the business. It's also found in Italian towns. It's found in Pompeii. Uh, we have here doubling, which is where you can raise them vertically or push them back horizontally, but you double the form. And then scaling, you can actually scale up or scale down the form. And we have these double Petersburg houses at every level of wealth. People who are attorneys and in the 1850s who are very wealthy live in a double house just as likely as a person working in a cotton mill lives in a tiny double house. Uh, diversification happens where you end up, you start with this basic tissue because everybody's doing more or less the same thing and the, the, uh, the, the slaves, the servants, and the um, apprentices all live in the, in the main building with the owner. So there's no need for any other housing except for the professionals. And then gradually people begin to move out off the street and have their own houses or, or work in industry. And then you get uh, a diversification of building types uh, in the tissue as well as with the special buildings. And also, in the U.S., you get something that Kanijo okay, didn't talk about much, but um, Kanzen did, which is you get um, a tissue accreting to the common boundary between lots. So like sheds getting pushed up to the boundary, and actually you might wind up with a wall, like the wall around here kind of, a, a wall that things back onto. And um, ranges, which is a kind of an English thing, where you, like in uh, Edinburgh, you have the main drag, and then you have these private ranges, which are uh, individual lots, people building these. With squares, I'll go back to them like an Private, yeah, the private ways with 
little cartons on them. And then, uh, then those can, later on, they often become public. Just, just like today, when you do a subdivision, um, many times the subdivider wants you to, the public to take it. And then we have uh, essentially the synoptic table, which this is just a few selections from it, but we have single cell uh, houses, we have side passage plant houses that come in single and double versions as well, and then we have center passage plant houses which don't come in double versions because they are, are, are they're organic, they have a center and sides and you can't add on to them that way. But you can of course link these but in Petersburg, they very rarely made row houses that were longer than just these double houses, occasionally. And then you have the, at the buildings, that was, sorry, that was the architecture scale. At the building scale, we, we gave people rules for facade composition in residential buildings. And these are just examples of how you might do that with the ceiling heights and wall openings. Then we talked about a special building, which is where you have buildings that, are, that serve the community as a whole, or that want to look like they do. <laughs> and uh, you have, these often use the classical orders to express their participation in the urban order. And by the type of order they select and the way they materialize it, they actually help people understand where they are and who they are and what's going on politically and socially in the urban order. It's a kind of, um, it points out particularly the political order very clearly. And it could actually help people to work together to make things better. Uh, often that residential tissue uses the orders by extracting very little bits of them in like a porch or moldings that you might use, but they don't, they rarely use them whole hog. I got to work at, as David pointed on the, on the list survey in um, Nauvoo, and there they really use the full panoply of the orders because their political order is not democratic. And so you had uh, different levels of authority in the community and each one got actually followed this rule so closely the orders are either fully expressed on Joseph Smith's house, they're only halfway expressed, you have an implied palace, you've still got an entablature on a merchant or a lawyer, and you go to the, finally, on down the line, and you end up with buildings that have entablatures, and then you get down to the ones that don't even have the full entablature. But it very clearly expresses the political order of the city in a way that, are, it, it's not expressing it, it's embodying it. And that's all. And I didn't mean to show you that. That was just on the computer. <laughs> Americans have never encountered, for the most part, Bruce obviously has, but I think it's been, it's, there have been some conferences dealing with it, but I certainly don't see it much in literature in there. Did you do this for a particular project you were doing research on? Well, I started with the Nauvoo project, and, and we, uh, we did in fact use this way of looking, only we were using more of the Westfall hierarchy working there, and they basically used Asher Benjamin as their pattern book for, for Nauvoo, uh, Illinois. And they, uh, they, everything's based on the choragic monument of, of uh, Thrasyllus. You know, it's all, it's very interesting how, how much uh, they embody the West, the American and the Western classical tradition in their own specialized way. And then when they get to Salt Lake City, the temple stops being a kind of idiosyncratic Corinthian and it becomes a kind of based on the houses of Parliament. It becomes Gothic revival, which is almost like a way of saying they're trying to differentiate their religious and political lives in keeping with their newfound <coughs> understanding of themselves. So it's, it's really amazing how closely their architecture responds to their, their situation politically uh, and culturally and where they are. They only had 10 years in Nauvoo and they built 300 brick buildings. It's kind of, kind of amazing. And we also connect this to the vernacular, basically. The vernacular, one way to look at the vernacular is it's like a simplification of the classical. Another way to look at it is the roster of decisions that you don't have to make gets longer, where in classicism it gets shorter. So many of those That's decisions, That's great. Yeah. many of those decisions are, uh, you don't need to think about this because we've already kind of solved that. And uh, you know, a farmer would say, I'm a farmer, I don't need to do this, right? I don't need to figure this out. Where um, uh, it's not it's not that it's just sort of some um, uh, just an artifact of um, always doing something because, like like Steve says you know we do this because it works for some reason 
operationally, it's like we do this because we do this. We do this because we've done it because ultimately because it works. But but you don't have to ask more, yourself that question, right? Like why you know do you, why do you um, why do you put a new trap on your sink? You know you I mean you can there's an actual reason. But everybody does it. You don't have to worry about, you know, if you go and you buy the pipes for your sink, it's going to come with the u trap You don't have to think about it. And that's kind of what this kind of vernacular is. It's stuff that you don't have to care about and, or uh, decide on. And it's, they call it spontaneous, but as I understand it, the spontaneous consciousness, it's more like um, uh, uh, untutored consciousness, or but we all use it. We all have areas right. where we're untutored, and we're all using like when we think what a garage looks like, our house looks like. We we don't stop and necessarily ask ourselves that question unless we're architects. <laughs> well, everybody's an idiot about everything except what they're good at. Right. So when we heard the word crisis earlier in Andres' presentation. He talks about several different crises: terrible, or remarkable, or extraordinary crises. And the crisis that more Troy talks about is not a bad thing. It's actually where we find ourselves, and it's actually what happens whenever you don't know what to do. And what happens when you lose your spontaneous consciousness is you have no rules by which to make decisions. And that's what modernists are. They're people that have no idea of what to do. So they substitute, they substitute whim and, uh, and sort of, you know, like copying out of a book or a magazine or, or what, they're, what they think might be kind of novel. But they really have no idea what to do. Whereas a classical designer has a beautiful set of, of possibilities that they can draw from. And so the, the neatest thing is that it, it, this is not just a way of looking at the past and saying, oh, this is where the main street was, and this is the lot size. This is a tool for our crisis. And that we can actually use this as a, as a system to help us make and choices it's also in the future. inherently respectful. This is a way of respecting people uh, that we live among who aren't allowed anymore. Uh, and the products that they did, that we aren't the master architect, the brilliant expert. And the, one of the biggest issues with modern classicism as well as with modernism is that we still think of ourselves as this kind of professional uh, assistant to the prince, like Vertruvius was. He was the slave of the prince, of the, of the emperor, and he had to do basically whatever the emperor wanted. Uh, Alberti and uh, Palladio were independent professional agents who could act for themselves and think for themselves, which is a big difference from the Vitruvian model. Who did the modernists like the most? They liked the Vitruvian. Because <laughs> they, they like to have everybody working for them and doing exactly the way that they dictate. I missed the beginning of your talk, but did you refer back to the military camp to Castro in terms of the... I didn't get into that. Camp? I just was okay. did a very general... I was, okay. I'm really giving you the moratory Kinegia approach, not my own personal uh, take. But I, yeah, that's a very important thing. But really, any colony from Greece on uses a grid pattern according to the moratories. But to connect it, the and this is also connected to Douglas Duwani because of some book on Roman something or other, I forget the name. But basically, the Romans, what Canetia and Lefebvre call the matrix routes, the, are what um, uh, this one book, it's like McDonald or McDonald. Yeah, McDonald's a wonderful book on McDonald. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. And he called I've got it, it, I can't think of his first name. Yeah, he called it the um, armature. William, isn't it? And I don't know. The classic armature, the armature is. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I footnoted it once, but I don't know. I don't remember. Um, so he says that there's this armature which is imposed from above, and it is not just the streets but also the public buildings, like the, um, the market. Um, and then also, there would be elaborations, like where a, a major route takes and diverts. They would build these, sometimes they'd build like a big, um, I don't know what you call it, like a big kind of outdoor temple thing, but it's not really a temple. It's a sort of a triumphal pile of columns. I mean, like, or in Pompeii, they use standpipes at these intersections that we don't quite know the meaning, the reason for them. They're, they're right. monumental structures at the end. You know, you have this, there's somewhere, I don't even remember where, but there's like this, uh, where is, there's, there's North a, Africa. North Africa, there's, there's, there's a street, but there's arches over the street, and then 
when it diverts, then there's this big, uh, like, a, a column display, they call it. And it's a column display, and it kind of diverts you. So this was all part of that um, uh, uh, armature that was then filled in from. So, which is also connected to uh, the civil religion and so forth is, is a processional way. Right. The, the Roman Forum has got one, uh, got an armature. But this is the urban scale. This is where the, the prince or the, or the uh, body of aldermen makes decisions about where they want to put a statue or a fountain, which emphasizes certain processional or arrival routes. Like in Richmond, where you've got all these monuments placed at key locations. Right. So Douglas Duwani adopted that, and he started uh, talking about the armature as major commercial armature through the city. So the key to why I'm mentioning it is, if you listen to Douglas Duwani, I hope I didn't say on this, Douglas Duwani, when you listen to him talking about um, the armature and um, the, the furlong and all those things, he's basically echoing what Kanija and the Fae say. But, I mean, not directly, but it, it's totally congruent. It's totally in the same tradition of thought. It's the same idea. And the, the thing about the furlong is that it starts to set up a certain rhythm. It's like the difference between near and far is um, uh, happens really close around the 660 foot mark. So like if you're in the woods, you usually can find your way back in about 660 feet. Beyond that, it's like crashy. And it's actually a surprisingly uh, uh, sharp divide in terms of human perception. It's like basically there's one set of perceptions that's going one way and one set that's going the other way. And they cross pretty tightly right around like, I mean, yeah, six. 600, certainly within 600 to 720 feet. It's a pretty clear demarcation. It's like two blocks. Two blocks. Two blocks. So if you think about walking through the city, two blocks in this area is, is a certain mental thing to have. And in Pompeii, you have, uh, they put objects or artifacts or small edicules at, at, that probably at those approximate points to guide you towards the forum. Because it's an older city, it's an you know much more ancient city than the imperial period, but the imperial period felt sort of helped to make no, to emphasize the nodes to help guide you through the city. So where you know where, what do architecture and urbanism have to do with each other? They totally connect at that level, at, at the furlong level, at the level of main routes, at the level of you know which way does the building face, how many doors are on it, all of that stuff is not specifically. I mean, it's not specifically about classicism, but also fronts and backs and sides and formal, semi-formal and informal. Um, the, the newer, you know, oftentimes uh, there's a hierarchy of the shape of a house. It could be that you have the kitchen built first and then you add on the nice thing on the front. It could also be the opposite. You start with a house on the front and then you add, you uh, kick the kitchen, uh, kitchen dependencies off the back. But there's no matter how you do it, there's a rule system involved that I would really love to hear us talk about, especially because at the CNU in like two weeks I got to talk about it, and I haven't heard anything from people here about urbanism and how it hooks in, but it seems like it really hooks in here. Can we use the word urbanism in the plural if you're looking at immigrant communities like Moravians and Swedes um, making settlements? Um, did they import the mores and styles of the home country and do these survive? Or did this system it's very, it's, here become it's, the... It's very debatable. Uh, in the western part of the state, we have a number of, of plazas, centrally located squares where the courthouse stands in. And there have been different theories about whether that comes from the Ireland, from, from Ulster, or whether it comes with the Pennsylvania Germans. And I don't think anyone's ever been able to determine that. But like in the, the theory of the germ theory, whoever gets there first sets the pattern. And the English have set the pattern in these cities because they they made the grid. And so uh, then what will happen is you'll get a group that will come in like the Germans or Scots Irish, and they'll make a square, or 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 like the town turns into a county seat. You've got to make a square in an existing grid, which is what happened here in Richmond. But they instead of like putting up a beautiful piazza, they just sort of stick the new building in the existing grid. They embed it in there. And you can't even get around it, apparently. It was kind of tight. 
Well, I forgot to mention that Jefferson fixes that uh, uninflected quality because he, he picks three different sizes for streets in 1780. They, he gets the authorization to create Capitol Square. He also widens Broad Street by stealing the land from the joining lots, making it the widest street, and then Gray Street and Franklin are given sort of medium widths. Not all of it got done exactly, but Broad Street definitely was given the full width. So was there a kind of different feel to aristocratic Virginia as compared to Puritan Democratic New England? Um, I mean, we see some very grand... De definitely. Villages. New England is more built on an organic sort of village yes. model, where so, there aren't grid patterns necessarily. The cities, of course, have... But originally, it's very much a cow path, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, formation. Whereas in the set, in the in Virginia, there were no, there's no reason to have a town, other than for government purposes. So this this the colony struggled for 50 years to establish towns on the different rivers, so that they could establish tobacco inspection and ensure the quality of the produce, so that they get more money. But people didn't want to do it. They just the boats would just come to your plantation directly to your own pier, so you didn't need a town. So these many of these towns didn't happen until the early 18th century. A lot of them they're all gridded. Yes, the, the main parallel actually is more with the Scottish towns, which were hundreds of the to northeastern Scottish. So really it's related to the Ulster towns as well. Um, yes. They're probably the same town. Yeah. 17th century. So Fredericksburg is a kind of later concept for Virginia. Fredericksburg is a grid also. Petersburg, yeah. however, is different. Because of their geographical constraints, it grew up in all these different little chunks, none of which have an orthogonal layout. And the, uh, the, the man that owned and most of that land used ground rent to control his land. He didn't even deny it. He just would settle you on it and rent you some land. One thing to understand is that there were a lot of big, change, big differences culturally in the main places, like how the square was built. That was different culturally. The controlling... Um, there were two controlling uh, characteristics for how things were subdivided. One was the resistance to giving up your own land, your own ability to make your own food. So the more ingrained that was in the culture, the, the more you would resist subdividing to something smaller than what you could have a house on. And the other thing is the way that people inherited land. So England, with primogeniture, it's really kind of fascinating. They would go from a palace straight to many subdivided streets with lots of little houses. Um, places that had, uh, they would just subdivide by however many children they had, uh, tended to have a more like even distribution. They didn't just slam in, you know, from a palace to a to, you know, major subdivision. Um, but also, uh, a really fascinating example, uh, other pattern is the uh, Islamic pattern, where they would have families on streets, and uh, the person at the end of the street would often be like the head, and they would control who goes down the street. And so that whole, that whole thing is a whole other fascinating thing. And um, how those were subdivided, and the amount of control these would have on your sort of alley, dead end of the street. Fascinating stuff. The same Hakim has a great book on this, by the way. H A K I M. Yes, I, yeah, right. We got an announcement now. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.